outcome of the case entirely due to hidden evidence, but not if you give it at the last minute. So I thought that was pretty telling. And again, no report on the media about this or why it's important. So just another, uh, you know, another incident I saw in court that didn't really get reported. Now later on, as the trial was getting closer, I started going to the jury selection hearings. How this works is you put a potential juror on the witness stand and each lawyer and the judge gets to ask a certain amount of questions. Well, the questions that were being asked were uh, the same couple repeated over and over again. And Chambers would say, will you be able to tell the difference whether Abdul Mutalab actually possessed a bomb or whether he actually had an explosive device and different offshoots of that question. So I knew what Anthony Chambers' uh, defense in the case was that Abdul Mutalab did not have a uh, bomb that could have exploded. And Judge Edmonds, when she was asking her question, she kept asking this question over and over again. Do you realize that sometimes the media does not tell the truth? Uh, you know, in questions like that. So, and it was pretty telling knowing that Judge Edmonds uh, knew at least what I took from it, that she knew the difference in the truth in the truth as compared to what the media had reporting been reporting and that the media had actually been reporting a lie in the story. So I thought that was pretty telling. And uh, there was a date set just a few days before the trial for final jury selection. As my trial was ending, I got a text from my brother indicating that I would be testifying in the underwear bomber case that he heard on the radio in Florida. And I was actually shocked because even though I'd been talking to Anthony Chambers, and who indicated if he was appointed full attorney on the case, he would call me. He was not full attorney on the case. He was still standby, and therefore Abdul Mutalab himself had full decision over the witnesses in the case. So uh, I immediately headed over to the courthouse to see if I could find out what's going on. And I ran into Anthony Chambers outside the courthouse, different courthouse than the one I was at, but only about three blocks, three or four blocks away. I ran into Anthony Chambers outside, and he said uh, earlier that day that uh, Judge Edmonds asked Abdul Mutla who he'd be calling as a witness, and he said the only witness he would be calling would be Attorney Haskell, me. So, uh, again, I was quite shocked at that. I really wasn't expecting him to call me as a witness. Uh, the trial was then set for just a few days later. I think this happened on a Thursday, and the trial was set for the next Tuesday, I believe. And... Uh, Laurie and I were planning on attending every day of the trial, and we went down there on the first day of the trial. And the very first matter that was taken up was the prosecutor's request to kick both of us out of the courtroom for the entire trial, which I thought was pretty interesting. It was a motion to uh, remove Kurt and Laurie Haskell from the court, or something. It was titled something like that. And uh, the prosecutors indicated that I shouldn't be able to see all the witnesses. Uh, before I testify. I was set to testify at the end of the case after the prosecution put their case on, so I wouldn't be testifying for about a month is what they estimated. And um, Lori wasn't actually listed as a witness at all. So they argued their case, and um, Anthony Chambers said, you know, he didn't care if we were kicked out or not, so he had no response. But interestingly enough, Judge Edmonds said, I'm not kicking Lori Haskell out. She's not listed as a witness. I only have one requirement, and that is that she cannot talk to her, her husband, Kurt, about anything that goes on in this trial until it's concluded, which, again, was going to last over a month. So uh, would have made some very in for some very interesting times in our household. But... Very early on the next day, the case was settled with Abdul Mutilab pleading guilty to charges that require a mandatory life sentence, uh, which nobody ever pleads to a mandatory life sentence. Not only that, he made this long, pre-prepared speech that sounded like it came straight from the Pentagon, if you ask me. It used language and words that I don't even think he knows what they mean. Um, they weren't it wasn't language that I'd been accustomed to hearing from Abdul Mutalab during the case, and I thought it was part 
at least to me, I think there's some sort of plea deal going on that we don't know about that required Abdul Mutalab to give this speech, plead guilty to all the charges, and you know, and it's in order for some sort of promise that we don't know about, and nobody knows what that is. But you just don't plead guilty to a mandatory life sentence. Uh, further, I've known for quite some time that Abdul Mutalab was offered some very lenient plea deals, and it's told us by Anthony Chambers, and he turned them all down. So then I have the question of why would you turn down a lenient plea deal just to plead guilty to charges that require a mandatory life sentence? And I would really like an answer to that question, but I don't think we'll ever get it. Well, the sharp-dressed man is important for, for this reason. One, he was the one that I saw get Abdul Mutalab or help Abdul Mutalab board without even having a passport. Now, who else can do that? Um, not only that, he was a man of some authority because he went down the secure hallway and talked to management. And he said to the girl working at the counter, he's from Sudan, we do this all the time. Well. You know, who are the we that he's talking about? Is that CIA? I don't know. Who are, who are they that gets people on the plane all the time without a passport? So you have, and then you have the admission from uh, Dutch police that Abdul Mutalab didn't even go through passport control, and therefore he didn't go through security there at all. You have to really wonder, who is this guy? He's speaking perfect American English at a Dutch airport, getting someone on a plane, an international flight without a passport, without any bags or winter clothes except for a small gym bag I think he had. Why and how did this happen and who is he? He's the key to the whole story if you ask me. That's why it's important. This wasn't just some normal passenger that boarded his plane and he didn't go through you know security. He was someone put on the plane who shouldn't have been on who didn't go through security and that's why the sharp dressed man is important whatever his role in that was. The mainstream media won't talk about the sharp-dressed man because it blows the whole official story out of the water that Abdul Mutalab just got through security by mistake. You know, and he boarded the, the flight like everyone else. He didn't. He didn't go through security, he didn't show a passport, and he gets on our flight with a bomb or, you know, an intentionally defective bomb. So how can the media justify that? And not only that, you have the comments by Patrick Kennedy that we wanted him in the U.S. to track him. You know, anyone with three brain cells can figure out what's going on here. So how can they cover and actually report it? A week or so after the, the flight, very early on, I, I got a call from another passenger. And he said, look, um, you know, I don't want you to sound stupid when all the, the evidence comes out and the truth is known to everyone, but you didn't see what you did. What you saw was uh, an unaccompanied minor being escorted through security and you know I saw him after we landed in Detroit and I said okay and then I said well he wasn't a minor he was you know a teenager at least and this man said no he was a minor I saw him after we landed in Detroit and I said well did you see him before boarding and he said no I didn't see him before boarding but I know that's the same person and I thought it was really suspicious that he would say this uh, so, you know, I ended the conversation, and um, I did some looking into the man's background. I found out that he worked for a contractor for the Department of Defense, you know, which raised red flags to me. And then I did some more looking into this un unaccompanied minor thing, and I found out, well, you have to be under age 12 to be an unaccompanied minor. And the bomber does not look like he's under age 12 you know maybe he could pass for 16 or so but not under 12 and uh, Delta admitted that there were no un unaccompanied minors on her flight so that leaves me with a passenger calling me to try and get me to change my story uh, for what reason? I don't know. I, it's highly suspicious of me that he works for the Department of Defense. And interestingly enough, I Googled him recently and I see that he switched uh, employers again. And now he works for a company that's supported by 
the Department of Defense, various members of Congress, the Senate, and various other people in the government. So to me, it all points to what I've been saying you know, for quite some time now, that that's what happened here. They gave him a fake bomb, they needed to stage a terrorist attack, and that's what they did. The place I get the information from that it was a defective bomb was uh, well, two things. First of all, you know, for months and months and months, I'm just living with this idea that maybe my government tried to kill me by giving a terrorist a bomb to blow up my plane. And I had a I didn't want to believe that, and I really wrestled with this a lot, wondering if that was really true or not. And I didn't know what to make out of it. It was a big piece to the puzzle that I didn't have. And in late December 2010, Anthony Chambers was quoted in the Detroit Free Press as saying, uh, the government's own experts that they've hired to be expert witnesses in the trial have reported that the bomb was impossibly defective because it lacked a blasting cap. So to me, that was quite telling that the own experts hired by the U.S. government don't even support their own theory on the case, that they have said that the bomb was impossibly defective. Now, if you add that piece of the puzzle together with all the other terrorist attacks that have been happening in the past couple years where the FBI has admitted to giving out fake bombs such as uh, Mohammed Muhammad, the Portland Christmas tree bomber and you know the Wrigley Field bomber and at least five or six other ones that I'm aware of I can't remember all their names but they're all documented and all admitted by the FBI you see a modus operandi or an MO of the government here where they admit to giving out fake bombs to stage terrorist attacks and uh, to me it all points to what I've been saying you know for quite some time now that that's what happened here they gave him a fake bomb they needed to stage a terrorist attack and that's what they did Astounding revelations there from Kurt Haskell, Delta 253 eyewitness on false flag terrorism, which of course is especially important now with the build-up to war with Iran. Astounding revelations there. Today's quote of the day comes from Will Rogers. A fool and his money are soon elected. That certainly pertains to what we were talking about with Mitt Romney before. A fool and his money are soon elected. Will Rogers. That's going to do it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I've been your host, Paul Joseph Watson. Greetings, fellow InfoWarriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. Yeah, I'm signing these evil 1770 six flags. Doesn't get any more out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un-American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776s.